guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. On this video, we're going to be covering mood disorders, specifically depression. If you haven't done so already, guys, please do not forget to like and subscribe below. Make sure you press that red notification button so you'll be notified every time a new video is released. Without any further ado, guys, let's get started. First question. A nurse discovers a client's suicide note that details the time, place, and means to commit suicide. What should be the priority nursing action and why? A, administering lorazepam Ativan as ordered because a client is angry at exposure of plan. B, establishing room restrictions because a client's threat is an attempt to manipulate the staff. C, placing the client on one-to-one -one suicide precautions because the more specific the plan, the more likely the client will attempt suicide. Or D, calling an emergency treatment team meeting because the client's threat must be addressed. Oh, I still got the price tag on here. Hmm. All right, guys. So the correct answer is C. You are going to put that client on a one-to-one. -one. Let me tell you something. We don't play about suicide, okay? You never assume that a client is trying to manipulate, manipulate you or the staff. We do not play with... Let me tell you something. Whenever you suspect a client is suicidal, what do you do? You ask them if they're having thoughts of harming themselves or others. They say yes. What is the very next question? Do you have a plan? They say yes. What do you ask immediately after that? What is your plan? Why? You want to see how detailed that plan is. How much thought did they put into that plan? So, for example, if that patient says, my plan is to throw myself off of a mountain, but you live in Florida, right? So you're still going to address it, but that plan is not as lethal as the patient who says, I plan on shooting myself with my dad's gun that's located under his bed that he leaves alone from nine to five when he goes to work. You see what I'm saying? So it's very important. The more detailed the plan, the higher the risk of that patient following through. Any patient that is deemed to be acutely suicidal, they need to be on a one-on-one. -on -one. And when I say one-on-one, -on -one, I mean one-on-one. -on -one. That means they go nowhere alone. Even if they go to the bathroom, guess what? They're going to the bathroom with that door open because that sitter has to have their eyeballs on that patient 24 hours until that um, danger, that risk is over. Okay, so definitely sees the correct answer. The patient is going to be placed on one-on-one -on -one suicide precautions. This is why we always ask the patient, do you have a plan? As soon as they say yes, what is your plan? As soon as they tell you what the plan is, you have to find out, do they have access? If they say they're going to shoot themselves, do they have access to a gun? If they say they're going to hang themselves, do they have access to a rope? Or maybe that IV line, that IV tube that's hanging in the patient's room. So you always have to Find out what the plan is and find out if they have access to whatever that means is that they plan on using to kill themselves. All right, next question. Immediately after electroconvulsive therapy, in which position should the nurse place the client? A, on his or her side to prevent aspiration. B, in high fowler's position to promote consciousness. C, in Trendelenburg to promote, promote blood flow to vital organs, or D, in prone position to prevent airway blockage? I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is A, on the side to prevent aspiration. This patient just had ECT, okay? So their muscles are weak from it, and they may not be breathing the way they, they're, um, and originally they were supposed to. That's why when we do ECT, a lot of times we give them oxygen before and after, right? Those muscles may be weak. You know, those muscles that help you swallow may be weak. We don't want that patient to aspirate on their own drool. So we're going to put that patient, uh, place the patient on their left side to prevent aspiration. So that's why A is the correct answer. Something else you have to remember after ECT, patients are, tend to be very, very confused very drowsy, very tired. You know how when it comes to psych, we always want patients to socialize. We don't have them eat in the room. We always want them to eat in the dining room with the other, you know, patients, right? But when it comes to ECT, ECT and um, seizures, right? When it comes to those two things, 
um, we give the client a break because they're going to be exhausted afterwards. So we allow them to sleep it off because very often they need to sleep. So, you know, you might have, it might be dinner time, but they're still sleeping. You don't wake them up, let them sleep. Another important thing besides letting the patient rest after ECT, you want to always reorient that patient after ECT. This is huge in sight, guys, and I promise you're going to get a question on it. It's huge. You have to always reorient them because they tend to ha um, be confused immediately after they'll have acute confusion so you're just going to remind them of who they are where they are what just happened okay a client's diagnosed with major depressive disorder which nursing diagnosis should a nurse assign to this client to address behavioral symptoms of this disorder a altered communication related to worthlessness a b anhedonia b social isolation related related to poor self-esteem a e b so secluding self in room. C, altered thought processes related to hopelessness, AEB persecutory delusions, or D, altered nutrition, a less than body requirements related to high anxiety, AEB anorexia. I have no idea what this AEB means. If anybody knows, go ahead and leave it for me in the comment section because I have no idea what it means. But guess what? Even without knowing what that means, you should still be able to come to the correct answer. So I'll give you guys a moment to think of the question and your answer. All right, guys, and the correct answer is B, social isolation related to poor self-esteem, A, B, secluding self in room. Look at the question. Look at what they're specifically asking about. Behavioral symptoms. What are they doing? And that's, that is your answer, B. What do these type of um, patients tend to do? You tend, they tend to want to close the blinds, turn off the lights close the door. They don't want anyone in the, uh, in the room with them. What do they do? They get into bed, put the sheets over the bed. This is it. Social isolation, uh, poor self-esteem, ABEB, secluding self in room. I would love to know what this AEB is. Let's look at our other choices. Altered communication related feelings of worthlessness, AEB, anhedonia. Um, anhedonia, you guys do need to know what that is. Uh, many patients with depression do experience this, and that's having um, losing interest or pleasure in things that they used to have. C, altered thought process related to hopelessness, AB, persecutory um, delusions. This we see more in the um, schizophrenic patient, okay? Uh, D, alter nutrition, less than body with less than body requirements related to high anxiety, AEB, uh, anorexia. We tend to see this a lot in patients that are anorexic. So for our, for this question, guys, it's definitely B, the patient that has social isolation and what are they doing? They're secluding themselves in the rooms. And I'm giving you the other examples of what we tend to see, um, these types of patients do. Now you have to remember depression is anger, is aggression, turn towards self. I'm not worthy to be around anyone else. I'm a loser, nobody likes me, I'm not worthy. One of the ways you know a depressed patient starts to get uh, better, that depression starting to lift, is when they get angry with someone else for something such as, for example, if the patient's mother said she would visit on Sunday at, on Sunday at four o'clock and she never came and that patient gets angry, that's actually a good sign. Why? The reason the patient's angry is because the patient is now starting to see value in themselves. I'm worthy for mom to have kept the appointment to see me and she didn't come see me, so I'm angry at her. So this is a good thing. That anger turned from anger itself to anger out okay so don't be tricked by those types of questions that's actually a good thing because the patient's starting to see value in themselves and that's why they're being angry towards the out and not the end okay next question client diagnosed with major depression with psychotic features hears voices commanding self-harm a nurse is unable to elicit a contract for safety what should be the nurse's priority intervention at this time a, obtaining an order for lock seclusion until the client's no longer suicidal. B, conducting 15-minute checks to ensure safety. C, placing the client on one-to-one -one observation while continuing to monitor for suicidal ideations. Or D, encouraging the client to express feelings related to suicide. Guys, I already gave you the answer. 
right? What are you going to do? Put the patient on one-to-one? -one? Look, look at this. And that was a question I was telling you. I don't know why it came outside like a question. It says the client's been admitted and they're hearing command hallucinations. You want to know what command hallucinations are? Those are voices in the patient's head telling them to do something. And guess what? Whatever those voices are telling the patients to do, they feel compelled to do it. They can't help it. They feel like they have no choice. So that means if the, pa if the voices in the patient's head is telling them to stab the nurse, they feel like they have no choice. They are compelled to find something to stab the nurse with. If the voice is telling them to kill themselves, they feel compelled like they have no choice. They have to, compel, uh, they have to kill themselves. So number one, the patient's having command hallucinations. These are voices that are telling them to do something that they feel they have no choice but to listen, right? That's our first clue. Let's keep reading in the question. They're refusing to sign a no suicide contract. Whenever patients admitted to a psych facility, we have them, especially if it's, you know, they have um, schizophrenia or depression, we have them sign um, no suicide contract. It's a contract that says for this period of amount of time that I'm admitted, I promise I will not uh, attempt to kill myself. And I know it sounds crazy, but just them signing a contract saying that, it's effective guys. Okay, it has a very high effective rate. I know it sounds crazy, but that's what it is in sight. So the patient's hearing voices telling them to do things and they're refusing to sign a no uh, suicide contract. That patient's gonna be on a one-on-one -on -one because we're not gonna take that chance of them killing themselves. And while they're on one-on-one, -on -one, cause look at the C, while they're on that one-on-one, -on -one, we're gonna continue to monitor them. We're gonna continue to assess them for suicidal ideation. But for the time being, while we're not sure if they're suicidal or not, all we know is that they're refusing to sign the contract and they're hearing voices. We're not taking any chances. That patient's gonna go on a one-on-one, -on -one, okay? The nurse assesses a client suspected of having major depressive disorder. Which client symptom would eliminate this diagnosis? A, client is disheveled and malodorous. B, client refuses to interact with others. C, the client's unable to feel any pleasure. That's the anhedonia I told you guys about earlier. Or D, the client has maxed out charges, maxed out charge cards and exhibits promiscuous behaviors. And I'll give you guys a moment to think of your answer. Okay, guys, so the correct answer is D. If you saw D, you would rule out that diagnosis of major, depression, major depressive disorder. A, B, and C are all symptoms of major depressive disorder. Let's talk about it. A, they're disheveled and malodorous. You want to know why? They don't see any value in themselves. Remember, depression is anger and aggression towards self. I'm not worthy. Why should I take a shower? I'm not worthy. Why should I keep myself clean? Choice B, the client refuses to interact with others. Anger and aggression towards self. I'm not worthy. Nobody wants to help hang out with me. Choice C, um, unable to feel any pleasure. That's the anhedonia. I'm not worthy. All of those are signs and symptoms of uh, depression. So you keep those. But D, they're maxing out charge cards and exhibiting promiscuous behavior. When you see that, you need to be thinking of a patient that's going through um, going through mania, okay? This patient may possibly be bipolar, okay? So that's why D is the correct answer. Next question. A client with a history of suicide attempts has been taking fluoxetine, fluoxetine Prozac for one month. The client suddenly presents with bright affect, Rates mood nine to ten, nine out of ten, and is much more communicative. What action should the nurses? What action should be the nurse's priority at this time? A. Give the client off-unit privileges as positive reinforcement. B. Encourage the client to share mood improvement in group. C. Increase the level. Excuse me. Increase the level of the client's suicide precautions. Or D. Request that the psychiatrist reevaluate the current medication protocol. And the correct answer is C, increase the level of this client's suicide precautions. You better be watching that client a lot 
more closely. Why? The reason that client is so happy is because they finally came up with a foolproof plan to kill themselves. They finally figured out how they're going to do it. They, they've been watching the nurses. They've been watching the staff and they realize that between two and two 15, nobody comes and checks on the patient. So they have a 15 minute window to kill themselves. And by the time the nurse comes to check on them, they'll be gone. They'll be released from this pain and suffering of life. Okay. They did miraculous. They weren't miraculous healed. All of a sudden, they they don't have depression anymore. Look at the time frame. It says that the patient's been taking it for one month, four weeks. Guess what? Antidepressant medications don't even start to take effect. You don't even start to see those um, the positive changes. The patient doesn't even start to feel better for a solid four to six weeks. It takes a solid four to six weeks for this medication to be in this patient's system for them to even start, start, start to feel those effects of the medication. So this patient's only been taking it for four weeks. All of a sudden, they're Mr. and Mrs. Sunshine and they're so happy. No, they're happy because they finally figured out how they're going to kill themselves. So guys, when you get questions like this, the time frame is super, super, super important, such as this, okay? They're not miraculous healed. No. They're about to kill themselves and that's why they're so happy. All right. Next question. What is the rationale for a nurse to perform a full physical health assessment on a client admitted with a diagnosis of major depressive disorder? A, the attention during the assessment is beneficial in decreasing social isolation. B, depression can generate somatic symptoms that can mask actual physical disorders. C, physical health complications are likely to arise from antidepressant therapy. Or D, depressed clients avoid addressing physical health and ignore medical problems. All right, guys, the correct answer is B, depression can generate somatic symptoms that can mask actual physical disorders. Don't forget, and actually, this type of question is a famous psych question. <clears throat> Excuse me, not this exact question, but just this type, the concept. Yes, the patient's being admitted for a psychiatric disorder, but physiologic integrity always comes first. Whatever is going to physically keep that patient alive comes first. So somatic disorders, guys, that's, for example, I'm worried about my teenager. He's been acting up. And because I'm so worried, all of a sudden I'm getting headaches. Or I'm so worried, all of a sudden I'm getting stomach aches, right? But you always have to physically assess that patient. So that patient depressed and they're having stomach aches. But what if... That patient has a tumor in their stomach or a patient's depressed and they're having headaches. What if that patient's got a tumor in the brain? So you can't, you know, you can't just take a patient's physical ailments just because they have something psychologically going on. You have to do a physical assessment because many times something that's actually going on with that patient physically is being covered up somatically. Okay. And so you always have to take that patient's blood pressure, do the assessment, listen to the bowel sounds, ask them questions, because remember asking questions is also a form of assessment. All right. And you know, sometimes you might discover that a patient may, may need to be screened more closely or assessed even more closely for an actual physiological issue. All right. Next question. A nurse is planning care for a child who's experiencing depression. Which medication is approved by the FDA for the treatment of depression in children and adolescents? A, paroxetine, which is Paxil, B, cetraline, which is Zoloft, C, citalopram, which is Celexa, or D, fluoxetine, which is Prozac. This is a famous, 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 famous um, psych question. I see it all the time on NCLEX, um, HESI, ATI, you name it. You need to know this, okay? So the correct answer, guys, is D, fluoxetine Prozac. When it comes to um, antidepressants, this is um, the only one out of this list that is approved for children and adolescents. Uh, by the way, guys, um, fluoxetine, this Prozac, this is an SSRI. SSRIs are our first 
line treatment for depression. Before we try anything else, before we try MAOIs or anything else, we always start with the SSRIs. They tend to be the most effective with the least amount of adverse effects. Your choices A, B, and C are also SSRIs. Great, but they're not approved for children and adolescents, but fluoxetine is. A nurse recently admitted a client to an inpatient unit after a suicide attempt. The doctor orders amitriptyline Elevil for the client. Which intervention related to this medication should be initiated to maintain this client's safety upon discharge? A, provide six month supply of Elevil to ensure long-term compliance. B, provide one week supply of Elevil with refills contingent on follow-up appointments. C, provide pill dispensary as a memory aid. Or D, provide education regarding the avoidance of foods containing ty tyramine. Excuse me. All right, guys, the correct answer is B, provide one week supply of Elevil with refills contingent on follow-up appointments. I'm not crazy about this answer choice, but it's the best out of all of the choices that were given to us. Why am I not crazy about it? Because they said one week. Really, you don't even want to give one week, okay? You want to give three days. And that's not your decision. That's the doctor's decision. However, evidence-based practice has shown that three days, no more than three days, because after that three days, we need to see them in the office so we can follow up. We can do another assessment. Why? What we don't want them to do is go home and take the entire seven days worth of medication and kill themselves. Three days worth, they'll get sick. Okay, that's why we only want to give them three days worth. So number one, they don't kill themselves by overdose. And number two, it forces them to come back so we can assess them and see how the treatment's going. All right. Next question. A client who's been taking fluvoxamine, Luvox, without significant improvement, asked the nurse, I heard about something called <laughs> MAOIs because I'm like, okay, I'm going to try to pronounce it. Monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Those are MAOIs, all right? Can't my doctor add that to my medications? What is an appropriate nursing response? A, this combination of drugs can lead to delirium tremens. B, a combination of MAOI and Luvox can lead to life-threatening hypertensive crisis. C, that's a good idea. There have been good results with the combination of these two drugs. Or D, the only disadvantage would be exorbitant cost of MAOIs. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. It's annoying me. All right, guys. So the correct answer is B. Guys, when it comes to MAOIs, you can't take anything. The list of medications and adverse effects that you would have with meds and different foods is so ex so extensive. We really don't like giving MAYs unless we absolutely have to. And I keep saying we because I'm a nurse practitioner, but I know I'm talking to you guys who are RNs and you're not ordering it. So I'm just letting you know, you know, the prescriber, the prescriber. Okay. So with when it comes to MAYs, the patient cannot take any medication, nothing over the counter, nothing without talking to their prescriber first and getting it approved. Okay. Combination of MAOI and Luvox and not only Luvox, the list is extensive, can cause a life threatening hypertensive crisis. Okay. Um, those signs and symptoms of the hypertensive crisis that the patient can have, just in case you guys get a question about a patient that's taking an MAOI, and they have a pounding headache or palpitations. Those are signs and symptoms of hypertensive crisis as well. Now let's talk about the wrong choices. A, this combination of drugs can lead to delirium tremens. No, what it can lead to is hypertensive crisis, which we want to avoid. C, that's a good, that is not a good idea. That is a terrible idea. This is wrong. That's a good idea, no. Absolutely not. C is wrong. And then D, the only disadvantage would be, no. With D, number one, there are lots of disadvantages, okay? Patient needs to stay away from foods high in tyramine. They need to stay away from a list of medications. 
the list goes on. So, and number three, when it comes to answering these questions in nursing, remember what I taught you in that video I did on how to pass the NCLEX. Do we care about cost? No. When you're testing, it's a perfect world. We don't ever about care about cost. Whatever it takes to help our patient, that's what we're going to do. So don't ever choose a question that has to, don't ever choose an answer that has something to do with cost. We don't care about that, okay? So D's wrong, so the correct answer is gonna be B, a combination of MAOI and Nuvox can lead to life-threatening hypertensive crisis, okay? All right, next question. A psychiatrist prescribes an MAOI for a client. Which food should the nurse teach the client to avoid? A, pepperoni pizza and red wine. B, bagels with cream cheese and tea. C, apple pie and coffee. D, potato chips and diet cola. And the correct answer, guys, is A, pepperoni pizza and red wine. Why? Because they contain tyramine. Okay, patient cannot um, get anything that contains tyramine, um, no cured meats such as um, pepperoni, no aged cheeses, no red wine, no beer. All of these can cause a patient to go through hypertensive crisis. So we stay away. All right, guys, last question. A client is prescribed phenelazine Nardil. Which statements by the client should indicate to a nurse that discharge teaching about this, medic about this medication has been successful? Select all that applies. Now guys, you know how to answer select all that applies. I've done a video on this. We're going to treat this as what? True or false. So we're going to go through each one. If it's true, we're going to keep it. If it's false, we're going to throw it out. A. I'll have to let my surgeon know about this medication before I have my cholecystectomy. Absolutely true. Why? Be because before you have any type of surgery, you're sure to get what? Medications. And there are so many adverse medications that comes with MAOIs. By the way, Nardo is an MAOI. So you definitely have to know the surgeon, the doctor, everybody on the healthcare team that you are on an MAOI. Because guess what? If you're going to have to get a medication that has a strong interaction, which most meds do, depending on the patient's condition, that MAOI may have to be slowly decreased before the patient can get ready for surgery, okay? Choice B, guess I have to give up my glass of red wine with dinner. True, yes you do, because you can't have any red wine with MAOI, I told you that. Choice C, I have to be very careful about reading food and medication labels. Yes, you do, because there are so many medications you cannot take with MAOIs and so many foods you can't eat with MAOIs. Anything high with tyramine, you cannot have. Choice D, I'm going to miss my caffeinated coffee in the morning. That's false. That's, that's one of the few things that there's not an adverse effect with the MAOI. So that's not true. You don't have to worry about that. Choice E, what did I say? I'll be sure not to stop this medication abruptly. That is true. What did I just tell you? If a patient had to get off of it, they do what? Wean them. They have to get weaned off. They cannot um, get off that medication abruptly. Just the fact of them getting off that medication abruptly can cause them to go into hypertensive crisis. And across the board, guys, when it comes to psych meds, we never stop meds abruptly because it can cause a rebound or an adverse effect. Okay. So for this question, it's everything except for D. Guys, I hope you found this video to be helpful. Um, I hope you have a clearer understanding of mood disorders, especially depression. Please don't forget to share my content with anyone you know that would benefit from it. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you guys on my next video.